How can science help in the management of the marine protected areas that have already been created? Obviously, it must uh, provide the hard facts with a view to knowing exactly what the local characteristics of the marine environment are, how it functions, and also the impact of human activities. It should help to assess the management and implementation of uh, marine protected area management plans. It's necessary to monitor, to assess. It's necessary at all costs to develop an approach that is not based uh, solely on knowledge, it uh, must uh, also provide support for management plans. It's necessary to create a link between scientific activity and management activities. Impact, uh, for example, is a very good example of this kind of relationship. Here we have managers, conservationists, but also the whole of the scientific community, which is actively working on the subject. Of course, science enables us better to understand the marine environment, to know more about the species that live there. But uh, we must protect them, and we can only do this through our love for this wealth in the ocean which we're dilapidating and losing. And it's this growth in awareness, the global growth in awareness, that is the driving force behind uh, the protection of the marine environment. We must root this protection in a powerful call by the whole of society, saying, well, the sea is fantastic, it's a wonderful heritage, it belongs to everyone, to the whole of humanity, and we must keep it for us, for the sake of future generations. This is the general demand that must underpin protection. 360 million square kilometers of ocean, four and a half kilometers in depth, and 11 kilometers in the ocean troughs. We have devices that can't go that deep or that can only remain a few hours at that depth. So we're in a submarine looking through a tiny little porthole looking, thanks to the beam of a small searchlight for a couple of hours, we can't really see or do anything much. We have uh, to think about the future generations, and we need to live them a rich ocean. It's easy. It's simple. You don't need to manage things. It doesn't cost a cent. We just have to stop being aggressive and enable nature to have space, free spaces to fully develop, diversify, so that the fish will come back and the great predators as well. We can do this easily. Let's do it. It doesn't cost a cent. My work looks at the contribution that nature makes to the well-being of people, um, including their economic well-being. There are things from nature that we take from nature, we sell in the market like fish, but we also benefit from nature because marshes and mangroves protect homes and buildings on the shore, uh, they produce oxygen, they store carbon, and all of these things uh, have a value to people, but they're not always valued in the market. What we're doing here in this meeting is trying to understand how marine protected areas contribute to local economies and to the well-being of people um, at the coasts, but even far away in places like Paris, where people may care about the coast or may visit the coast uh, in the summer. And we're trying to understand how marine protected areas managers can do a better job of managing these areas so they produce more benefits to people while they're protecting important biological diversity. Thank you. Today's workshop, which has been organized in Impact 3, enabled us to listen to various different uh, methods which are used to evaluate ecosystem services provided by marine and coastal ecosystems, but also by those in the high seas, and to see that there is in fact a very wide diversity of applications of these uh, evaluations, whether it be in order to launch a plea, whether it be to make uh, trade-off analyses, or sometimes to work on the uh, sustainable financing mechanisms. The major lesson that we've learned from this workshop is that it's extremely important to ask the right questions very early on in the evaluation exercise, so that it can be as useful 
possible and as understandable as possible by the decision makers and by the uh, park managers. It's important to translate evaluations not simply into monetary terms, but to use a multi-criterion approach and to make use of different ecological indicators and also social indicators. We mentioned, for example, the fact that some fisheries create jobs, sustainable jobs, linked to the management of fishery. This is something very important. We shouldn't look simply at the monetary value of the ecosystem services. What we have been doing is working with marine protected areas to try to understand what ecosystem services are produced by these marine areas and how marine protected area managers can do a better job of managing these areas so they benefit people, um, fishermen, but tourists and local people alike. Science forms an important part of, of um, understanding what we are trying to protect and also contributing to the management of that protected area. To set up an MPA you need to know what is there before you set up the zone. The fishermen and the local communities are well aware of this and if we go along with science as well to support this then we can do much more and that facilitates the setting up of an MPA and its acceptance by the communities. We do research on how to provide incentives for people to conserve marine ecosystems and we're interested in both social and natural science. We have to understand the people, we have to understand visitors and we have to understand ecosystems. One of the biggest challenges that we face is that whilst in fact there's a lot of information out there, a lot of knowledge and a lot of science on the protected areas that we manage, accessing that information is incredibly difficult. So a challenge for us is, for example, taking scientific information and translating that into information that managers can use and information that's understandable for the, for the public. Uh, my job in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park in Australia, but in the past I've uh, done jobs that have involved engaging a lot with scientists like David. And I'm a, I'm a scientist, a coral reef researcher, and I work in the Cordier East Africa project. We have an office in Mombasa in Kenya, but we do coral reef research in the Western Indian Ocean. John, as a MPA manager, could you tell us how scientists are useful to you? <laughs> More than useful, I'd say they're essential. Um, but I also want to stress that science is not the only uh, thing we need. We need very good science underpinning, but we also need on top of that an understanding of how the community and the users, in our case, um, use the park. So the social science is almost as important as the natural science. Um, but again, when you look at our zoning plan, the way we, we have uh, broken the park spatially into zones, there was a very important science behind the, the zoning but then it got uh, further adapted when we engaged the public and talked to them and got their comments on where it was important for fishing. And then there was also a layer of political trade-offs. Could you tell us about the monitoring? Monitoring is a really important part to know how things are changing and, and uh, the rate they're changing. And the reality is there are some uh, pretty sad and scary changes happening in the Great Barrier Reef, whether we're talking about climate change, whether we're talking about the quality of water coming off the land that affects the Great Barrier Reef, we don't actually have the, the uh, scientists working within our agency. Our job is to really coordinate a vast range of scientists working in universities, 
in uh, research agencies that are uh, funded by the government. Uh, so we have a huge amount of information over many uh, decades that help us monitor the, the state of the reef and where we think it's going in the future. David, how does a scientist um, must work to be as useful as possible to the managers? So there's a lot of fundamental science that's very useful, that is, that is very valuable to have a, of its own right. But management is about um, managing people, about managing impacts. And to do that, you need information. You need the right information. So whether it's scientific studies or a monitoring program, it has to be designed in the right way to provide the answers, the types of answers that are needed for the management system. And while science is, is objective, and um, it, should, it shouldn't matter which scientist collects the data, um, you know, we, we, we provide data, we provide information that should be useful, it then has to go into much broader decision making in a consultative process. There's an important issue which is um, communication. Oh absolutely, science is useless if it's not communicated. So there's a lot of social science also that's needed to help inform how, how best can we, um, can we uh, manage or affect how people behave in the system. If I could also add that the uh, role of citizen science, I'm not sure if you were going to get to that, but it's not just the, the uh, pure researchers, uh, they do fantastic work, but uh, they have funding constraints. So what we do is we augment their research with local people who might, for example, a tourist operator might be going to the Great Barrier Reef every day. So he's monitoring it much more closely uh, than perhaps the researcher who might only get there once or twice a year. Bring that two together, you've got very powerful information. In many countries, like in East Africa, for example, in the Pacific, there's a lot of local knowledge, and these are knowledge systems that are very relevant to the ecosystem and to the, the uses that people are that applying. So we also need to incorporate other people's knowledge systems into the assessment of the information. So it's not just science that needs to be considered. The Hippoto project is a story that goes back to 2005. It began because of one observation. This was that we realized we knew nothing about the seahorses around our coastline. So with the Pueblo Association, we decided to launch some studies. And in the absence of any support from the major scientific organizations, we decided to work with non-specialists, with amateurs. Divers, of course, because this made it possible to observe of the species to carry out a census, and we also worked with schoolchildren. They helped us to carry out a survey among the various professionals and users of the lagoon in order to become better aware of what everybody more or less vaguely knew. Amateur divers are of course responsible for the places they visit. I think they want information. They're interested in participating in a scientific study. The the aim, of course, is to find seahorses and to gather information on their habitat, the species, their size, gather a maximum amount of data in order to fill in the forms. Of course, on the level of the scientific management of the project, we had to be permanently concerned to validate the data to see whether there were things that were strange or surprising, to see whether one observer, for example, had results that were way out of line with all the others. So there is genuinely a very precise and permanent monitoring of the quality of the data we obtain. Today, we have the divers, we have the school children, we have all the schools, we have the local authorities, we have the professionals, we have the scientists. All of them together are concerned by this same problem. All of them consider that there is a wealth of marine life in the Tau Lagoon in this natural habitat.
Nous sommes une filiale We are a subsidiary of CNES and IFREMER. We supply satellite services to study and protect the environment, and in particular the oceans. In terms of marine protected areas, we give scientists and managers satellite monitoring services. We monitor uh, the pelagic fish, mammals, and even fishing boats to ensure a sustainable development of uh, marine species. Our work, in general, focuses on marine protected areas. There are various approaches. There are the conventional marine protected areas set up on a one-off basis. There are managerial aspects, and more recently, we have adopted more participatory approaches. In Morocco, there is an initial bottom-up experiment. The fishermen themselves, over 400 of them, are managing given area with a view to small-scale fishing. We have activities which pertain to administrative capacity building in the five North African countries, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya and Egypt. The idea is to boost the use of satellites to uh, facilitate research. More recently, we have started seagrass mapping. This can be done using satellites, thereby saving a lot of money in terms of fact-finding on the ground. The I3 target says that 10% of the areas should be, uh, the coastal and marine habitats should be under protection. In India, we are far behind that. GIZ, the Indian government, is bringing together uh, different stakeholders like the state governments, the local governments, fish workers associations, scientific community, different NGOs together on board to discuss who benefits from coastal marine protected areas, what should be the legal regime under which the protection should be conferred to, and how much is there need to, to develop capacity of different uh, stakeholders. And we are like uh, here looking forward to learn from other uh, countries and other marine protected areas uh, on what challenges they are facing and if there are some similar challenges that they are facing then how can we learn from them how they have tackled this. So the conclusions concern several major areas. The first of these is what is everybody going to take home from these workshops, what I've called the toolboxes. The second major area, this is what are the gaps in our knowledge? What do we need to know to complete the network of MPAs? What strategy should we use? The third major area is to ensure dialogue, dialogue between sciences, an inter interdisciplinary dialogue. And we need to foreground, in particular, social sciences and human sciences. And then the fourth major area is to ensure that, uh, in practice, evaluation is really implemented. We know the methodology, but this is not widely developed in practice. And then the last major area is to ensure participation of the various players, information and raising awareness.